My Years in Waconia by Edith Nagel Isinger, Chapter 2. We were in the hospital over the drugstore for two and a half years, and all that time we had in our minds that we needed more space. We needed better equipment, and we needed more of everything. We needed better facilities in order to serve the people in that community. So all that time, doctor was buying more equipment and planning for a hospital. We needed a place to build the hospital, so we bought the house next door to us. In the summer of 39, we had that house torn down and space made available for erecting a new hospital. By spring of 1940, when the frost was out of the ground, we had the place excavated. Doctor had made the plans himself of what he wanted. Of course, I helped him and got some of the things I wanted. But there really wasn't much, and I had to settle for really much less than what we should have had. The main thing I got was closet space in each room. So that was the decision to get the hospital started. In the meantime, we were busy, busy, busy in that place over the drugstore. We sometimes had to turn people down, or he sometimes had to take patients into Idle Hospital or into St. Barnabas or the Swedish Hospital because we did not have any space available over the drugstore. It amazes me today to think how much we could do in that space over the drugstore and the major surgery that was done. It's unbelievable to think we could manage to do all of that. By June, the workers were very much on the way to getting that hospital built. Doctor had bought the brick. It was solid brick, red Alton brick. The main bricklayer was Bill Stewart from Rush City, Minnesota, a nice person. And he brought a couple good bricklayers with him from Rush City. They would find a place to stay during the week and go home weekends. And every week these bricklayers were paid. They did not have to wait until the place was finished before they got their money, but they were paid every week. We had many people from the area that would volunteer their work. Farmers would come in and say, you helped us, now we want to help you. Anything they could do, like carry mud or bricks, or later on carry tar for the roofing. All of the people were really looking forward to seeing the hospital in Waconia. It was fun seeing them there. Every morning and every afternoon, I had to be sure to have lunch for those workers. Doctor said, we've got to have some lunch. He said they work better, and it's a friendlier atmosphere around there. So every morning, about 10 o'clock, and every afternoon after 3 o'clock, they had lunch. Probably a sandwich and some coffee, or some cake or rolls or whatever and they always enjoyed that little morning or afternoon break. The bricklayers worked frantically all summer and really did a nice job. By October 15, 1940, we moved some of the patients from over the drugstore. The first one to go in there was a woman. Her name was Linda Meyer, and she was admitted as the first patient to the new Nagel Hospital. It was quite a day. We had worked very hard to get everything in place and the furniture in. We had ordered some nice furniture for the private rooms. The Nagel Hospital had four private rooms, two double rooms, and two wards with six beds in each. At least we had ample room for 20 patients. It seemed like heaven to have some space. We had a delivery room, an operating room, a nursery, two kitchens, one upstairs and one downstairs, a supply room where we had moved the autoclave over, and the water sterilizer and work tables. Everything that we needed to begin our new place. It was quite a day, the moving and all, but it was very worthwhile and rewarding to think we had accomplished that much. That was on the 15th of October. About the 25th of October, we had an open house. It was a Sunday. I don't know how many people walked through that place. We still had a few patients in the hospital at the time, one very ill patient. Of course, we had to keep that door closed. She was in a private room. It worked out OK, and the other patients there didn't mind seeing all those people go through. I think we had over a 1,000 people that went through. 
I had served a little piece of cake and some punch for each one. I think I had ordered a thousand pieces of cake, and we ran out of cake and had to use some cookies. Everyone was happy, and we certainly were pleased to think so many people were anxious to come and see the place. It was heaven to have so much space to work in and to be able to move around in and to be able to give better care to our patients. So that was the beginning of the Nagel Hospital. Oh, I forgot to mention, there was also a porch on the main part of the hospital where the visitors could visit or anyone who was staying with someone very ill could relax. That was in October. By the 1st of November, we pretty well settled in. On November 11th, 1940, it had rained in the afternoon and it had turned to snow by mid-afternoon. It raged a storm and we were really, really worried. Doctor had delivered a premature baby on November 11th that I had in the incubator, along with several other babies in bassinets, I think three or four babies, plus the one in the incubator. Doctor had gone into Minneapolis right after delivering the baby to get supplies and just never got home that day. He didn't get home till the next afternoon and he had walked from Victoria, Minnesota, which is about five or six miles from Waconia. He had not been able to drive or get any rides, so he had walked and he had borrowed a farmer's overalls to keep his own clothes dry. He had an umbrella with which he shielded himself from the strong wind. The storm was still raging on Tuesday. The electricity went out on Monday at about two o'clock in the afternoon. No lights and no heat. We did have local telephone service available, but I wasn't able to call to Minneapolis where I thought doctor might be. But I was worried about what I should do because I had sick people in the place with no lights and no heat. It was a real concern. I called a real good friend, Vesti Fisher, the electrician who had wired and done all the electrical work on the hospital. I called Vesti and said, what in the world am I going to do? I have no lights or heat. We can't cook. We can't do anything. And Vesti said he'd come and round up someone to see what we can do to get some heat into the place. I wish I could remember the names of all the men who came to help. It was just amazing. Everybody was right there to help and try to keep things going. We had a rubbish burner down in the basement next to the furnace. These men gathered up wood and had a good fire going in this rubbish burner. Then Vesti fixed up a fan, wired it up to batteries to get that going somehow, and blew the heat up the laundry chute. So we got quite a bit of heat up that way. And they found an oil burner that they set up in the hallway and vented it out through some duct so we could get heat into the hallways. Neighbors came and brought blankets or hot water bottles. All of the only way we could heat any water was down on that stove by the furnace, the rubbish burner. They kept the fire going and it was nice and warm down there. It did help some, helped quite a bit. One neighbor, Mr. Rudloff, brought blankets over in cars. We were short of blankets that we should try to keep warm. A lot of people who couldn't get out of town to go, to, to go home came to the hospital. There were people sitting in the corridor, probably with one of those blankets. Anyway, they were sheltered by being in the hospital. Of course, we stayed up all night. We had candles for a little light to see where we were going. It was a worry, and I worried about doctor. Where was he? Stuck in a snowbank someplace and wouldn't survive? Or what? I didn't know. The babies. I took a drawer from one of the cabinets and set it on a table down in the basement where there was a fire going. It was quite warm there, and we had all the babies in one drawer. And I told the men that were working down there, keeping the fire going, that I would be down there taking care of the babies. We got hot water bottles filled, hot water from the rubbish burner, and kept the babies warm and had lots of blankets. Even the little premature baby was doing just fine, and I was able to get some water or formula down to the baby. Of course, he didn't need too much right away. 
I came down one time, and Vesti was carrying this little premature baby around. He said it was crying, and he thought he would hold it, and maybe it would be a little more comfortable. I said, we better not play with those little babies. We better just put them back in the drawer. But I did get them to check on the babies, and they were all doing fine. This went on all during the night. The storm raged. People had sought shelter in the building. By morning, we wondered how, we were, how were we going to feed our patients. We would, would have had to give them cold cereal and milk or what we were going to do. We couldn't use the toaster. We couldn't cook anything as we had nothing to cook on. It wasn't too long when one of our neighbors, Mr. Blatz, a professor over at the Lutheran School adjacent to the hospital, came with a three-burner stove on the toboggan. Someone helped him carry that in, and they set it up in the kitchen in the basement and were able to cook coffee and cook cereal and fix breakfast for the patients. It was wonderful how the people all came to my rescue. I just appreciated so much everything that everybody did. I just could never express my gratefulness to all those people. It was just beyond comprehension. So that part went all right. We had enough food. I still wondered. I hadn't heard from doctor. There was no way. There was no telephone line coming into town. And I think at that time, all the local lines were down too. We just went ahead and did what we could and kept patients comfortable. We took care of the babies too. I think it was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon when doctor walked in. It was such a relief to know he was okay, but he had walked all the way from Victoria. He was glad everything had gone okay. He had been worried, too, about how we were doing in the hospital and was relieved to find these people who had helped us. How thankful he was to them, grateful to them and all the people who helped. I can never, ever forget that snowstorm of November 11th, 1940, and it is remembered by many, many people. There were many lives lost. The hunters, some were lost and some were killed in the blizzard, and those that survived had to stay probably at farmhouses or wherever they could get shelter. It was one of the worst storms we have ever had in this area. Finally, late that afternoon, the electricity was restored and we could continue to do our work. It was quite an event and something I will never forget. I'll be eternally grateful to these men who came to my rescue to carry in wood and build that fire and keep things going. I wish I could remember all their names, but I know there were several of the Wagner people and of course, Vesti Fisher was the one I had called. Then we were really snowbound for quite a while. We had good supplies of everything in the hospital. We had lots of canned goods and canned everything, and the milkman came and brought our milk. We had power so we could do some cooking again. It was an unforgettable time. <laughs>